but he's not there. He's speaking about God. He said, I go backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, he doth work. Job said, I know he's working. He said, but I cannot behold him. I can't see him. I don't know where he's at. Can't, can't physically, spiritually, mentally find God. That's where he was at in his life. He said, and he hideth himself on the right hand. He said, but that I cannot see him. But verse number 10 is wonderful because Job says something that is very powerful. He said, but he knoweth the way that I take. And by Job saying that, let, lets me in on something else. That even though Job did not know where God was in verse 8 and verse number 9, it really didn't matter because there was one thing that Job did know. You know, they tell you, you got to know everything about the Bible. You got to know everything about God. You got to know everything about church. I'm going to tell you, if you'll just understand one or two little simple facts, you won't have to worry about a bunch of stuff. Because it's not about what you know. It's not about how much you... It's, let, let me put it this way. It's not about how much you know, but it's about what you know. And in one or two things is life-changing. Job said this, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I mean, that carried him through chapter 1, chapter 2 to 42. You can run on I know my Redeemer liveth. You can live on my Redeemer liveth. But he said, I don't know where he's at. I can't put my hand on it. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know where God is. I feel like he's a million miles away. He said, he hideth himself on the right hand. I cannot see him, but he knows the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Some people would say that was a braggadocious statement by Job, bragging that he would come forth as gold. But if you know anything about going and purifying gold, there's nothing to brag about. It's very painful. It's very excruciating. It's very hot. And seven times over, they would reheat that gold to get out all the impurities. And those high priests would make sure that they could see their reflection in that gold, especially around that brazen laver, that brazen altar, around that gold. They could see their reflection and see themselves. And I'm telling you, that's what God wants in our life. He'll, he'll refine you and refine you and refine you until God can see himself in you. And then and only then, God can use you for his glory and honor. So this morning... And we talked about the simple thing. How do I know God's working for me? How do I know God's working on my behalf? How do I know this is God? It's not the devil. It's not the flesh. It's not me. But it's God that's working. Because a lot of times, I mean, you can just about do anything spiritual if you want to. You can go pass out tracts. You can go knock on doors. You can go preach. You can go sing. You can go with. You can do a lot of things for God. And, you know, there's times where God says, I want you to talk to her. And I want you to talk to him. I want you to talk to them. There's a difference. There's a difference. And I believe in being sensitive of the Holy Spirit. But I also believe in knowing that God's in it. I want God to, everything that you do, I'd rather God be in it than me try to accomplish it on my own in the flesh. You know, it's like there's a church on every corner without a preacher every two years. Well, you, you know, it's like you go pick one and say, okay, I'm here for a little while. I'll go pick another one and go there. I, I, I don't like that. that. That's just not how I was raised and brought up. I was raised and brought up. Bloom where you planted. Let God use you where he puts you. Don't, you know, jumping from pillar to post, that's one thing. But another is saying, God, are you really in this? How do I know God's for me? And so that's kind of the, the, the theme that we went with this morning. And then I quoted this verse out of Job because Job was right in the middle of God's will even though he couldn't find God. He was in the center of the will of God, even though he said, I look to the right, he's not there. I look to the left, he's not there. I go forward, he's not there. I go backward, he's not there. I know that he's working. I know that he's hiding himself. But at the end of the day, Job said this, I know he knows the way that I take. And that's all that matters. And if you believe God, the just shall live by faith, not facts. If you believe God and you believe that you're saved and born again, I'm telling you something, there's nothing like resting in the true peace and the presence of God for your life. And so Job realized that he could not find God in darkness. And I thought about a couple of people in the Word of God that says, God, where are you at? And if you've never been there, trust me, you might be there this week asking that simple question, God, where are you at? Job was wanting to know, God, where are you at? And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, I don't know if anybody's in here had a little baby before. I mean, we've had four. We got our four and no more. Ain't that right? Amen. Our four and no more. So says I. 
But you never know, you know what I mean? They're making bigger minivans nowadays. You wouldn't believe the big ones they got now. <laughs> but as a child, they, you know, they're, they're attached to their mother. They, they are nursed by their mother. And then there's a, there's a time and a point that comes where mama's got to wing them. And mama's got to, you know, quit nursing and then go to regular food, you know, bananas and strawberries and those cans of that green mush that stinks to high heaven, makes you want to throw up when you look at it and smell it, but they got to eat it or they ain't going to get better. They ain't going to get bigger. They can't stay on milk forever. And what mama will do is she will step off to the side and she'll walk away from that high chair. And what she's doing is she's not leaving that baby. She's not abandoning that baby. What she's doing is she's winging that baby. To let that baby realize you can survive without mama 24-7. You don't have to have mom 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And eventually the baby understands, man, I can feed myself. I can drink a cup by myself. And then eventually they'll tell you, don't feed me, don't give me any drink. And then they'll tell you, if you don't mind that on the way home from church, I know we just ate, but I wouldn't mind a big double cheese whopper and a king fry and a large cocoa. I'm starving. I said, you just ate. I know, but I'm hungry. So you, you know the progression. And I think a lot of times God does that. He'll pull himself back to let you realize that you really ain't nothing on your own. And we are. We're nothing without God. We're nothing without His presence. We're nothing without His power. We're nothing without His touch. Job lost God in what I would call spiritual darkness. I'm trying to figure out where, where is God? But he was close enough to where God could get a hold of Job if he needed to. He was close enough to catch Job if he needed to. He was out in the middle of darkness. I thought about Matthew 14. You don't have to turn there, but Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 22, there's a passage here about the disciples. They were out on the, the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 14. And the Bible says this in verse number 22 of Matthew chapter number 14, if I can finally figure out where it's at. Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get in the ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Jesus didn't need Kirk Mellish. He didn't need Glenn Burns. He didn't need Ken Cook. He didn't need a meteorologist. He knew there was a storm coming. Nothing, nothing has ever taken God by surprise. And he sent him away to the other side. And the Bible said this, that when he sent him away to the other side, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And it was in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into them walking on the sea. So not only is there points and times where you're wondering where's God at in darkness, but it may be where, where's God at in danger. God knew danger was ahead, but He sent them on anyhow. What a loving God we serve. Can I get a witness? What a kind and gracious Heavenly Father to send us right in the midst of danger. I believe with all of my heart He knew that they were going to make it to the other side. That's why He told them. He said, I want you to go to the other side. Because he knew they were going to make it to the earth. God's not going to tell you to do something and then forsake you. God's, God's not going to lead you down a road and then utterly walk out and forget about you. But I will say this, that in those times of danger, you wonder, God, where are you at? God, what are you doing? Why have you put me in this position? Why have you put me in this place? Because God wants you to realize He's not only God of the darkness, God's also God of the dangerous times too. The Bible said He come walking to them on the fourth watch of the night. The darkest part of the night, He come walking to the disciples. And the Bible said the disciples saw Him walking on the sea. They were troubled, saying it's a spirit. They cried out for fear. It scared them to death. They couldn't even recognize him for who he was. And I'm going to be honest with you. God can allow you to get to some dangerous places where when God does come to your rescue, you'll wonder, where is he at? Is that really God? Is that really him? And the Bible said, Jesus straightway spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And then that's when old Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come on. Come on. And right in the midst of the storm, Peter walked on water. He didn't calm the wind and the waves during the, during the walking on the water. He come walking on the waves. He come walking on the water in the middle of the storm. I'm telling you, he's the God of danger. He'll be there in the dangerous times. He'll be there in the dark times. I thought about another verse of scripture. It's found in John chapter uh, number. Well, let's go. Let's go to First Kings chapter seventeen. 
I like this one too. I forgot about old Elijah. Elijah. He got in a, he got in a mess. First Kings chapter number 17. Listen to what Elijah said. Elijah said this. He said, uh, he said, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, verse 1 of chapter 17, before whom I stand, there shall, be, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. You know what the Bible says? The Bible said they went into a three and a half year drought. No rain, no water, no dew. I'm ta you say, how dry is that? Dry as cracker juice, good neighbor. I'm talking dry. I don't know if you've ever experienced a drought before, but just a couple of years ago, we experienced probably one of the worst droughts in Georgia we've ever experienced. Lake Lanier dried up. All those marinas down in Buford, Lake Lanier, Sprout Springs, they all went out of business. Nobody had nowhere to put their boats. And if nobody's out on the water on their boats, they, don't, they, don't, they can't sell boats, they can't fix boats. All those marinas dried up because of a drought. I now I know a couple of bass fishermen went out there with some big old tires and said, we're going to create us a honey hole when this water does come back. We'll know where the bass are. And they, they, they put some spots out there. Well, I know where the bass are at now. They took, it, they took advantage of that old drought. But I'm telling you something. Lake Lanier got to a point where the state of Florida was suing the state of Georgia because they needed water. Water. The Army Corps of Engineers had to release the water from Buford. And I'm telling you something, a bunch of rednecks said, we ain't going to have that. And one of them went down there in his canoe while they was releasing water. And they had to stop releasing water because he's going to die. It was serious. My, I'm telling you something, I'm not a Floridian, I'm a Georgian. And I tell you what, we first if we got the lake. Can I get a witness? We first. That's our water. That's what they were saying. That's our water. And I'm telling you, a drought make you go crazy. And, this, and the preacher said, listen, he said, until you hear from God, there's going to be a drought for three and a half years. But I'm going to tell you what God did in that drought. He led Elijah down by the brook Cherith. And down by the brook, there was a stream of water. And by that water, God fed that man of God, fed him cakes, fed him steaks, fed him, got, got, had water. I'm talking God met every need he had. I'm talking met every need he had during those three and a half years of drought. He's, hey, even though it's a dark time, even though it's a dangerous time, even though it's a time of drought, I'm telling you, he's still God, and besides him, there's none else. You wake up Monday morning and say, where'd all my money go? Honey, you in a drought. <laughs> you, you in a drought. Or you go, you go to work one morning, you driving along, and all of a sudden... You feel this. Da, 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 da. You go, man, what in the world did I hit? And you get out and look, and your tire's flat. And there's wires coming out of it because the tires are gone. You in a drought. I'm going to tell you something. The God, the God of the good times is still the God in the bad times. And when you can't find him in darkness and you can't find him in danger, you may not be able to find him in the drought. He's still there. And even after, even after God did send the rain, think about this. You've got to go all the way to chapter 18. God's, you remember he sent, that, he sent that cloud and it looked like a man's hand. You remember that story? And it was right after that that the preacher went into a spiritual drought, wanting to know where God was. And then an earthquake came, then fire fell. But then you know where he found him? In a sweet, small, still voice. I'm going to tell you something. There's times where you ain't going to find him in the fire. You're not going to find him in the wind. You're not going to find him in the earthquake. He ain't going to be in the fire. He'll be in that prayer closet. And it'll be that sweet, small, still voice that only you can hear and nobody else can hear but you and God. I'm telling you, he's the God of darkness. He's the God. You can find him in darkness. The Bible even commands us to do this. Call unto me. Seek me while I may be found. Over, I mean, over and over again, ask, seek, and knock. You go through the Bible, he talks about seeking. out. It, that's our job is to seek him. But I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of people that go into darkness and they quit looking for him. They go into a drought and they jump ship on God. They go into some dangerous time, they jump ship on church. They jump ship on the Word of God. They don't go back to that prayer call. I'm telling you, that's the time you need him the most. All right, I'm done with this one and I'm going to be finished. Watch this. John chapter number 11. There is times of darkness. God, where are you at? Where are you at in the darkness? Where are you at in the danger? Where are you at, oh God, in the drought? I'll tell you something. He's there. And he may have you there for a reason, for a purpose. But in John chapter number 11, I want you to notice what the Bible says. John eleven twenty one. 21. 
Let's start at verse number 20. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary still sat in the house. <laughs> Mary, wasn't, Mary sat in the house because she was fine and dandy knowing Jesus was in town. But not old Martha. Watch this. The Bible said, Then Martha, she said unto Jesus, she said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. I'm telling you something. There's people that's looked for him in darkness. There's people that's looked for him in the drought. There's people that's looked for him in dangers. But I'm telling you something. There's people that will look for him only in death. It'll take death to turn some people back to God. That's a, sad, that's, a, that's a sad story to tell, but it's the God's honest truth. God's got a way of turning man. God's got a way of speaking to man. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's through the grave. God, where are you at? Well, God, I can't see you. I can't feel you. She said, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And you know what's crazy? She is telling the God's honest truth. Because he's the resurrection of life. He never, he never went to a funeral. He never preached a funeral. <laughs> Matter of fact, undertakers had to give back their uh, deposit when Jesus showed up to preach because they had to give total, complete refunds on the funerals Jesus preached. Everybody got out of the grave when he preached. Everybody. That's the God we serve. And through the death of Lazarus, she said, where were you? I'm telling you, she was looking for him. She was longing for him. She needed him. She wanted him. And then he died. And then, she's, and then she, lets all, she lets out all this emotion. She said, if you would have just been here in my life, he wouldn't have died. But what did he say? He said, listen, he didn't die. But for the glory and honor of God. He died so that God could get glory. He died so that God could get honor. It was to glorify my Father which is in heaven. And you know what the Bible says? He came to the grave. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He which was dead and bound, he came forth bound, hand and foot. Still had the, still had the mummy clothes on. And I'm going to tell you something. God Almighty, every one of these people, Job, Elijah, the disciples, and even Martha. God saw them through darkness, drought, danger, and death. Even though they couldn't see it. Even though they couldn't experience it. I'm going to be honest with you. There's times, and I, and I think it happens to everybody, where God sometimes will wing himself from us. And let us try it on our own. Let us do it on our own. And by, at the end of the day, we're going to say, God, where are you at. Can I tell you, he's just a whisper away. He's just a, he's just a reach away. I'm telling you, the Bible says, draw nigh unto God. And what does the Bible say? And he will. He will. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. You know what the Bible says about the devil? Resist the devil and he will flee. I heard somebody say years ago, he said, stop telling everybody you're having trouble with the devil because you've just told on yourself. You've not been resisting him like you should have. Because if you'll resist him, he'll have to flee. I'm telling you that, that same way with God. You draw nigh to God. God. That's what God wants. That's why he created man in the garden anyway. He wanted, a, he wanted communion. He wanted to be glorified. He wanted to, be, uh, he wanted to receive all honor, all majesty, all power, all glory. And that's why he created man because he knew he could get it out of man in his sinful condition. I'm telling you, there's nobody like him. I'm glad to know that when we can't find God, he sure got a way of finding us. And I'm going to tell you one, I'm going to tell you this last one and I'm done. I went to church on a Wednesday night. I was about 15, 15 years old. And I walked in, I wasn't looking for God and I had no intention on finding God. But I was sitting in the back of the church and the preacher got to teaching. Not even preaching, it was just a, it was a Wednesday night teaching lesson on the coming of Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, somebody crawled back here on the back pew where I was sitting. Somebody spoke to my heart. I'm telling you, I've been in church my whole life, and I've never had nothing like that happen. I said, oh, something's wrong. 
And I'm going to tell you something. I said, we got I told my parents, I've tried, we got to go. We need to get out of here. Let's get, I got school in the morning, trying to get my mind off of it. But somebody crawled in that 1998 Grand Marquis. Followed me all the way to Stockbridge, Georgia. I thought, man, if I just get inside that house and lock that door and padlock it, I told Dad, I said, Dad, let me lock up tonight. Let me lock the front door. I went down the hallway that night, and I thought, there ain't no way he can find me here. I made sure I was on the top bunk, not the bottom bunk. You can't crawl that high. I laid up there on that top bunk. I was trying. I was running from God. I was running from that message. I was running from that word. I was running from his spirit. And I laid there in that top bunk that night, and it was about 11 o'clock. And I said, Lord, have mercy. Woo! Somebody's talking to me. I'm going to be honest with you. You know what I did? This is stupid. It's, it's one I ain't dead. I was so unnerved and it, it, tore, it tore my stomach up so bad. I got out of my bed. I made sure there wasn't nobody looking. I ran in there in the kitchen. I found that bubble gum medicine. Pepto Bismol, maximum strength. I turned it up like a like a fifth of liquor and I drank as much as I could. I'm telling you, I said, it's just my nerves. Oonk, 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 oonk. I went crawled back in the bed. Man, I had I had peppermint on my breath. I said, I'm gonna get me some sleep now. That helped my stomach. And he crawled back up in that bed with me again. Buddy, I had all I could take. I jumped out of that bed that night. I remember I went and got my mother. I said, Mom, I said, listen. I said, I need to be saved. I'm lost. God spoke to my heart. And I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know I need to say, I know I need to be saved. I'm gonna tell you something. Even when I wasn't looking for God, even when I didn't want any part of God, he came to Squire Parson said he came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. And I'm gonna tell you something. That's grace. Grace is that which God does for me that I don't deserve, that I can't do for myself, that I never will be able to pay back. That's the grace of God. I'm telling you something. He, he, he got a hold to me that night, and I'm telling you, my life was different ever since. I didn't go looking for him, but man, he looked for me. I'm telling you, even now as a Christian, every once in a while, God will remind me, you can't get too far because I found you as a lost person. I found you when you was undone. I found you when nobody else was looking for you. I cared for you when nobody else did. And every once in a while, it's good to just take your mind back to the day you did get saved, the day you did walk down that aisle, the day you did get down on your knees, and the day you did call on Him and say, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and save my old wretched soul. It's good for that to take place because that reminds you of the day you first met Him. The day you first met. I'm telling you, ain't nothing like knowing him. Don't matter if it's dangerous. Don't matter if it's dark. Don't matter if it's a drought. And it sure don't matter if it's in death. I'm glad to know, standing some, the songwriter said, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. Ain't nobody like him. Amen. Father, we love you tonight. I thank you for your precious, holy, divine word. Thank you for the good liberty we had this morning. Thank you for the good service, the good atmosphere. Lord, thank you for filling this church up with more visitors, Lord, coming to visit with us. And I just give you all the honor. I give you all the glory. I pray, Lord, as we send out more postcards and, and Lord, invite more people, Lord, I pray that you just send in the laborers in the field for the field. Hey, Lord, it is ripe. Harvest is ripe. God, we need you now more than ever. We need church now more than ever, especially in this day and hour in which we're living in. God, we need you. We need your spirit. We need your word. And I pray, God, that we'd spend our life drawing out of you. Lord, trying to figure out how can we get closer? How can we scooch up just one more inch? How can we get just one more centimeter closer to God? How can we get next to the breath of God and feel the touch of God? Lord, we need you more now than ever. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to bless and work in the hearts and lives of your people. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We ask all things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen.